In our latest reading from the archives, we're focusing on summer holidays. We have some great stories, including a 10-year-old's experience of holidaying in the east of England, a trip to Vesuvius, boating on the broads, and plans to turn Great Yarmouth into a seaside resort in the Victorian period. In this holiday journal, Sir Robert Harry Inglis Palgrave talks of his experiences of holidaying in the east of England. Sir Robert was born in 1827, making him around 10 at the time of the journal. He was the third son of Sir Francis and Elizabeth Lady Palgrave, knee Turner, who were abroad as their journal starts. Sir Robert later talks of them arriving back home, stating that he was very glad to hear you were safely arrived in England. In his journal we discover that he was travelling with Miss Mabor, perhaps a nanny, and he talks of staying with his aunt and uncle. He writes, August 10. My dear Mamma, there was a poor French person on the top of the coach who could not speak a word of English, and she brought a card to say so, and if Miss Mabor had not spoken for her, she would have lost her box, for she could not tell the coachman where it was, and she had in her hand a blue satin bonnet pinned up in a piece of lining, which bonnet she left at Newmarket, and when coach was about to start, she called out, Mon chapeau, mon chapeau, and the coachman, not knowing what she meant, was going to drive off if Miss Mabor had not asked him to stop, so the poor lady recovered her bonnet. We had a very pleasant journey, and saw that the harvest was begun in several places between Epping and Newmarket though Uncle John thinks that it won't be begun in Norfolk for a fortnight or three weeks. August 30. My dear Mamma, our luggage had just come from Ersted, and therefore I am glad to say I can write journal again. You would never guess in what a strange manner we came here. Mr Gunn was so kind as to send his carriage to convey us to Burr, but there we found no places in the little mail. Uncle John had told Miss Mabor before we set out, that if there were no room for us in the coach we should return to Ersted and not take the carriage on to Yarmouth for fear of overtiring the horses. But Miss Mabor thought it would be inconvenient to aunt and uncle to send us to Burr again, so she took the resolution to walk to Yarmouth. August 31. Yesterday we went to the beach and I built a fine fort. One the wall, two the chapel, three governor's house, four the citadel, five servants' house, Six Tower. When it had been allowed to stone a little, it was bombarded with little and big stones. After that, it built another, which, as far as I can recollect, like this: one the fort, two the servants' houses, three the ditch, four the wall. Our walk from Burr was a fine long one. We went along very merrily with a trusty mountain guide, that is to say, an old gentleman who, like us, not being able to find a place in the coach, was forced to walk and who very kindly offered to shew us the way to Yarmouth. September 1. Today we went to the beach with Miss Mabor, and I built a fine fort, but I had not quite time to finish it, but even as it was, it was very large. Today Reggie bought a nice gun. September 2. Today Aunt Harriet was so kind as to get us some nice peas to shoot out of her guns. Our next document is a letter from Geoffrey Ransom to his family as a boy on holiday in southern France. It was written in 1926 when Geoffrey was around 13 years old. When not on holiday, Geoffrey was attending Gresham School in Holt, which is where he remained until 1930. He writes, Dear all, Saturday, none. Arc et Saint Sanon, Sunday 16th, 1926. Sunday. I have been a very naughty little boy by not writing yesterday. But Friday, I did nothing else than to sit in the shade of the trees and read a book. It was so hot. Yesterday, I went for a bike ride in the morning, and in the afternoon, I went to the English-speaking ladies. She has got a huge garden, and he showed me round her huge garden. She has got chickens, goats, rabbits, guinea pigs, and hundreds of things. Today I got up at 5.30 a.m. Mr. Burcott, Roger, and I went mushrooming. We did not get many, but it was awful sport. I should say we got about a hundred altogether. I got twenty about. 
We got back at 9.30 and were half an hour late for church. We rode 26 kilometres. Basla, Roger and I. In England it would be about 24 miles altogether. I am absolutely done in now, for it is nine o'clock already. Good night. Monday. I woke up at 8.30 this morning and did not get down till nine o'clock. That is my record. My legs are quite stiff today. Yesterday we went to Lombard, which is seven kilometres from here, and to another place three kilometres off here. To Lombard was 14, and as we went to the other place twice, that was 12, and for mushrooms, 14 kilometres. I don't like mushrooms very much, but they are eatable. Tuesday. The little rabbits are getting on fine. One is beginning to eat the stalks of clover and dandelions. I have not been very well today. I've had a tummy ache. But I took some of your patent cure, and I am much better. I told Monsieur and Madame Beryl yesterday evening that I had one, and said that I had some medicine upstairs that you gave me. But he told me it was poison, and told me he would not take the stuff. Madame got some flowers of the pine tree out of her packet and boiled them in water and I drank the water with a few lumps of sugar. This morning came no results, so I used some of your cure up in my water glass. This afternoon I had results. Don't you think that was clever of me to drink poison like that? I do. It was quite an adventure, Wednesday. Les petits lapins are getting on fine, and I think that is because I feed them on dandelions, and the soft, milky thistles that don't prick, don't you? Um, when I have nothing to do, which is often the case, I go in search of these. But there are not many left now, so it takes rather longer to get one armful. In later life, Geoffrey studied architecture at Liverpool and after qualifying became the junior partner of Messrs Towndrow and Ransom. His career was abruptly interrupted by the start of the Second World War. Geoffrey took a commission in the Royal Army Service Corps and was sent to Calais as second lieutenant in the British Expeditionary Force in 1940. He was captured almost immediately and sent to prison camp at Laufham near Stuttgart. After the war, he continued his career as an architect, married Elizabeth Brighthouse and had a daughter, Mazella. Our next document comes from the records of Dean Philip Lloyd, Dean of Norwich between 1765 and 1790. It is a diary of M. Derbyshire, who visited Italy as a companion to Dean Lloyd between January to September 1788. In the diary, M. Derbyshire records the trip to Vesuvius in 1788, describing the scene one night from the balcony of their lodgings. They write, I had the pleasure of seeing the fire come out of the crater and run a considerable way down the side of the mountain. There were little burning particles in the sea, like glowworms. They describe the initial ascent on donkeys up the mountain with vineyards on one side and sometimes lava flowing amongst them. Then the group decided to sit down, which is where M. Derbyshire takes up the story. When we got to the top of the mountain, but not to the little mountain where the crater is, we sat down to eat some hard eggs we had brought with us, during which a throw from the crater sprinkled us and our provisions with little cinders. The waiter trembled for fear and advised us to go down immediately. We did not take his advice, but proceeded. This part is nothing but immense pieces of cinders, but very hard. When we got to the top, an amazing thick smoke from the crater with a strong sulphurous smell almost stifled us. We held our handkerchiefs to our mouths and covered our eyes, but still it got down my throat so much and made me cough that I began to be in great agonies and set off to go down. The smoke was so thick that I could not see one of the company, though I heard them talk very distinctly. In about five minutes the smoke cleared and I went again on the opposite side to the wind and was highly gratified. When I saw into the crater there was no opening, the smoke issued from three different parts. 
the edge was as sharp as if cut with a knife. The bottom appeared only about 50 feet deep. We found the situation very warm. Our dog who went with us cried terribly and Morgan was obliged to hold him in his arms. The sulphur made him so sick that he vomited. A little lower down we saw a large mouth out of which came a hot sulphurous steam but not like that at the top which was like mustard in one's throat or that sort of thing I have felt at stirring sometimes a coal fire before it is well burnt. Our Cicerone went down a little way to bring up some beautiful things which were encrusted upon the stones. They were very like cauliflowers and some twinged with yellow and brown. We were much distressed as we found the poor man could not get up again. He was frightened as he found he could not hold himself much longer. We made therefore a collection of handkerchiefs and tying them all together made a string long enough to pull the man up. We did not look what time it took us to get down, but it appeared very short as I stuck my heels in the sand and slipped a yard or two at a time. I got, however, several falls by not being able to stop myself when running. My hands and wrists were scratched, but my feet came off very well. I had made a strong, thick pair of shoes into half boots, which kept the dirt out for coming down. It was deeper a great deal than one's ankle. One heel got entirely off and holes at the bottom began to let in stones. However, as I found another pair when I got to the mules, I felt very comfortable. Mrs Twiss lost both her heels and almost all the sole. Of course, her feet suffered extremely and were bruised and cut a good deal. Next, we have a child's diary of travelling on a boat called the Sprat or the Shrimp. It was created by the daughter of Arthur Henry Patterson, a naturalist and illustrator from Great Yarmouth. The diary gives details of trips on the broads and includes illustrations by herself and her mother and three by Arthur Henry Patterson himself. She begins. Year 1925, beginning July 28th, 1925. July 28th, Tuesday. Horrid day, lot of wind, but no rain. Daddy went round, got a new man, Frank Upcraft's son. Jimmy, going to ask his baby's name. She couldn't remember, very peculiar. Jimmy came back in the evening, said they made Lowestoft too much tide to go on to Yarmouth. July 29th, Wednesday. Went by bus to Lowestoft, very crowded. Dad met us and took us straight to Spartan. Went up river at once, got stuck because engine stopped. Got her to go again and began to go through Braden. Daddy cheered up a bit. It began to rain. There are 110 posts in Braden water, 55 each side. Had to lower our mast to go under bridge as train was coming and they would not open it. Daddy got us rooms at the Star Hotel as we could not sleep on Spartan. The room had a funny ceiling and looked out on the quay. July 30th, Thursday. Daddy came for us a quarter to ten and we had a walk round Yarmouth, met Mr Patterson. By the time we got started it was about twelve. Went up a good way and petrol gave out. Daddy refilled us and we went on till just before tea. We passed Stokesby but the children did not sing John Barley. Then we went on till, just below the mouth of the thern, the engine gave out. We hoisted foresail jib and trysail and sailed when we got within the mouth of the thern. Had a fair wind. Got to Potter Ham about five and got moorings. Finished tea and got sprat. He pecked. Just as we were putting up our curtains, a big thunderstorm came right over us. Billy thinks it will rain some more. I hope it won't. Made good bed for magic and treacle at end of bunk. Two sheets doubled, blanket and coverlet. July 31st, Friday. Had early tea, had a bathe, very cold. Had breakfast. We went and shopped and got letters and then rode about for a red Japanese sunshade. Had dinner. Rested, read midi and ensign and eat chocolate. Mummy and Daddy went for a sail. After tea, we shifted our moorings and just bagged our place in time, as that horrid enchantress was going to have it if we'd been a minute later. 
Then I took Mummy and the Teddies for a row in shrimp. We looked at the Enchantress. She had not been altered. Mummy began to read Aunt Jane and Uncle James, and she felt cold and had to have a hot drink. August 1st, Saturday. Mummy feels all right and we had a bay. Daddy upset the milk, but there was a little left. After breakfast, got the letters. Circus programme from Eileen. She closed on the 30th. There is a big dog over the way called Brutus. Went for a walk and saw the church before dinner. There was a poor dead bird there. After dinner, rested and took Mummy for a row in shrimp. We saw the dearest baby wagtail and a father wagtail feeding it. Then we came back. Daddy put us up railings round the inside of the boat and he sat on my hat. We had tea and it has now begun to rain. Then we got some bacon and went to look at the windmill and then it began to rain and it rained all the rest of the day. August 2nd, Sunday. We woke up, still wet, did not bathe. Then mummy made custard and it was too late to go to church. We rode about for some time and then mummy thought she would like a bathe. So daddy brought us back and we bathed water quite warm. Had dinner and rested, did not go to church, began doll's dress, tacked it and hemmed some. Had tea, did some more hemming after tea, too late to go to church. Had sail in dinghy almost to Martham. Caught water beetle, kept him in saucepan basin, rode all the way back, turned out water beetle inside Sprat. Hope he will multiply. Read and went to bed. This acrostic came from the diary of Jay Starling of Worsted, detailing a stay with his wife in Great Yarmouth in 1876. Aged 70 at the time of the trip, Jay Starling includes descriptions interspersed with religious reflections of the trip. Starting by train from Worsted to Yarmouth, the couple stayed at Duro House, Wesley Street, North Deans. He writes... An acrostic on the aquarium. A beautiful building of late is built here, quite opposite to the Victoria Pier. Until now, there was nothing but sand on the shore, and where Neptune's billows so loudly do roar, remarkable fishes within may be seen. In the tanks, they are swimming, all prisoners within. United to this is a grand skating rink. My initials, when read, will explain it, I think. Volume 10 of the journals of Hilda Zigamala includes her trip to Lake Como in September 1905. Hilda was approximately 35 at the time of the trip and was a seasoned traveller, having married Major Pandya John of the 19th Hussars Cavalry Regiment at Ralpham in 1889. She lived with her husband in India from 1891 to 96. She writes... Lake Como. Hotel Bellevue, Cadenabia, Lake of Como, September 21st to 30th, 1905. We came here from Lugano yesterday. It's a very easy journey. We went by steamer to Portesa. There we had lunch and I did a sketch as it's a lovely little spot. We then got into an absurd little sort of toy railway, which in an hour took us through lovely scenery and landed us at Menaggio. We got out to view Lake Como. This is a lake like a small sea. It struck me as so much larger and grander than dear Lugano. We were quickly hustled onto a steamer and arrived here where we found this most charming hotel, quite like the dear old palace of St. Moritz, full of very smart Americans and Italians, so different to our awful Germans. At the hotel in Lugano, we had an awful bother over our rooms, as I simply flatly refused to sleep with Dora. She snores so. We had an awful fuss and bother to get separate rooms, and Dudley had to use a bathroom as a bedroom. I'm sure he thought me an awful brute, making such a fuss. But really, it was all Dora's fault for snoring so awfully. Thursday. We are simply delighted with this place. It is too lovely, far nicer than Lugano, and the hotel is charming and so amusing. There are lots of people we find we know here, a Mr. and Mrs. March, Mr. and Mrs. Lawson Johnson, 
Miss Tyne, Lady Louise and Margaret Fielding, etc., etc. So we're most gay, but I fear Dudley doesn't care for it as much as Lugano. He prefers having us all to himself. I sketched all the morning, and in the afternoon there was a grand sort of regatta of beautifully decorated boats. It was most amusing and beautifully done, some of the boats being really lovely bowers of flowers. It was such a gay scene, the landing stage of the hotel being the chief centre of interest, with boats coming and going. Dear little motor launches puffing up every minute, and the smartest ladies getting in and out. A band playing in a huge flower-covered barge, etc., etc., and brilliant sunshine overall. And with the beautiful scenery as a background, we enjoyed it all immensely. We went for a long stroll all along the edge of the lake in the evening, and very lovely it was too. Some of the villas being like fairy tales to look at, illustrated by Walter Crane. In the evening there was a dance at the hotel, but of course we didn't take part. It made me very envious. They all seemed to be having such fun, and I longed to be ten years younger. The Victoria Building Company was established in 1840 to develop as a seaside resort land at the south end of Great Yarmouth. They had many grand plans for the area, which this prospectus explains. Prospectus for the establishment of a company to be called the Victoria Building Company. Capital, £200,000 in 20,000 shares of £10 each. It has long been a subject of surprise and regret that the town of Great Yarmouth, which possesses so many peculiar natural advantages as a place for sea bathing, should still be destitute of adequate accommodation for the reception of visitors. When it is considered that upon the eastern coast of England there does not exist a single bathing place worthy the name, from Scarborough to the mouth of the Thames, a distance of nearly 200 miles, it cannot be doubted but that Yarmouth might become a watering place of the first consideration if the example afforded by the other places were followed here. The Victoria Building Company, having arranged with the proprietors for the purchase of ground which embraces a frontage of upwards of 600 feet towards the sea, intend to apply to the Town Council for the purchase of so much of the present waste to the southward, as may be necessary for the purposes contemplated, and to lay out the whole upon some well-considered plan, having as a primary object the erection of a spacious terrace next the sea, with lodging houses of a superior description. It is proposed to call the new buildings Victoria in honour of Her Majesty the Queen. The advantages to be derived from the extensive improvements contemplated must be felt by every class of the inhabitants of Great Yarmouth and it is therefore to be hoped that the undertaking will be generally and liberally supported. The amount subscribed will be called for by instalments of which ample notice will be given and it is confidently anticipated that the capital of the company will be most advantageously employed and that the result to the shareholders will be highly satisfactory. Reynolds and Palmer, Worship and Son, Solicitors to the Company, Yarmouth, 25th of August, 1840. Our final document is a typescript journal of the week's boating holiday on the broads taken by four young Methodist men from London. Written in the mid-20th century, the men give good details of where they went, what they ate and what their thoughts were on the local villages. They write. Saturday. Arrived Alton Broad at 1.20pm, Arthur and Alec. After leaving Lorry Park Avenue 8.20am and number 79 Stanhope Grove at 8.50am. Had coffee and biscuits 11.30 at Colchester. Jack and Ralph arrived Alton Broad 1.15pm. Were in Waller's for lunch while we were searching for them. Lunch finished at 2.15pm. Then Alec and I took all personal kit to George Robinson and got it aboard whilst Jack and Ralph purchased stores. Had to go to Lowestoft for meat. All business and office finished at 330 Stores aboard by 4pm. 
finally left Alton Broad at 5pm. Alec took over first. Tied up 5.45 for tea. Pilchards, tomatoes, lettuce, salad cream, bread and butter, jam and marmalade, cake, Mrs J and tea. Off at 6.15pm. Jack was first and knocked his head in cabin and I was a good second in aft cabin. We got under toll bridge at cut with only inches to spare, save two shillings here. Another cruiser was stooging around, windy, and later we saw bridge go up. Tied up selling and ferry, 9.20pm. Supper, soup, crisps, biscuits, coffee. Bed at 11pm. Sunday, awake at 6am, nap until 7am, then gunfire prepared by Jack. Ralph was up and dressed by 7.10 and we foregathered in main saloon. Alec and I still in bed and had a disseration on balanced life until 8am. Decided not to go to Norwich, insufficient time if we were to reach Yarmouth at 2.30pm. Breakfast, 8.30am. Grapefruit, toasties, fried egg and tomatoes and coffee. Finished at 9am. Jack out in dinghy, then for a run around, shorts only. Then Ralph in dinghy whilst Alec and I washed up. Left for Yarmouth at 10.25, stopping at Brundle for water at 10.50. Our anchorage in Surlingham was not too good. We had to tie up below the hotel. In morning, large coal boat, being polite and keeping clear of us, almost run into Windward Bank. Skipper shouted that we were asking for trouble anchoring in the bend of a river. Alec had been out for half an hour in dinghy, wind not very strong, some photographs taken. Took five gallons of petrol and filled up all tanks with water, leaving at 11.10am. Elevenses at 11.15, coffee and biscuits. Tied up Yarmouth YS at 1.50. In on ebb tide, no need to turn. Found room for mooring, then was little room to spare. Had dinner at 2pm. Lamb, peas, pots, carrots, ginger pud, custard and coffee. Saved dinner for Bert, who duly arrived at 2.45pm. Mooring fee, four shillings. Left Yarmouth at 3.30pm. Jack and Ralph getting first three pints of milk. Tied up Acle at 5.10pm, tea 5.30. Tomatoes, lettuce, apple etc. Bread and butter plus jam and cake. Left Alec in charge whilst the remainder of crew, four, departed to church at 6.15pm. After a mile walk, found Acle Primitive Methodist Church, but no service. Premises were open Had a wild idea we might have a service of our own, but wiser counsels prevailed and we returned to F Eagle, arriving at 7.20. Jack and Bert took Dingy out for a row at 7.30, returned at 8.15 when Alec and Arthur did likewise, but without that evidence of the same professional skill. The rest of the crew enjoyed rogation day service over the radio. A perfect sunset and a calm evening. Promise of another fine day tomorrow. Supper, full marks to Jack, who produced toast and meat paste, very tasty. Followed by rhubarb tart, vote of thanks to Pat. 11.30pm, turn in. Monday 23rd of May. At 7.15am, Jack roused the party with cups of tea. Rather a dull morning, but a promise of a fine day. Hardly any wind. Alec and Arthur take a dip, and at 8.30, Jack produced a three-course breakfast. Grapefruit, bacon, kidney and toast, with meat paste, marmalade, bread and butter and coffee. At 9am, Arthur and Jack visit the Emporium on the opposite bank. Left Akel at 9.35, after stowing stores aboard. Mop overboard at 10.15am. 
Jack went out in dinghy for it, but no luck. Off again at 10.25am. Few spots of rain. Horning at 10.50. Sun out again and warm. Alex bought pail, six shillings and threepence. Left Horning at 12.25. Tied up rocks and broad, 1.05pm. Wait as anchor. 1.10, lunch served. Lamb chops, new potatoes in casserole, smashing. Cabbage, gravy, followed by apple charlotte garnished with cornflakes, coffee and jam slices. A lazy afternoon. Alex tootles about the broad with a sail on the dinghy. Arthur, Ralph and Bert walk into Wroxham. Sign posted half a mile. It is probably nearer to. A disappointing village, scrappy and shops with shabby cement fronts. The local power is apparently Mr Roy, who owns most of the shops of all types, from fishmongering to antique furniture, his enterprise, including the street lamps and the public lavatories. Having bought a mop head to replace Alex's casualty, the three musketeers hiked back to the launch. An unsuccessful attempt to get fresh eggs at a local farm and rather tired Arthur with a blister to contend with, the trio were cheered to see tea ready laid by Jack. Fresh salad and sardines, lemon juice over the lettuce, followed by jam, marmalade and syrup on bread and choice of cake. The discourse which followed centred around flooring compounds. 6.50, Jack took the wheel for the port of Coltishall. Tied up at Rising Sun Mooring. Mooring fee 1 and 6. At 8.30pm. The crew went for a tour of inspection in village at 8.40pm. A pretty village, some character. Supper, soup, crisps and frankfurters. Captain and crew then enjoyed themselves discussing this and that. Jack soon rose to the level of the practical interpretation of the faith, including the attitude to international war. At 1.30am or later, with some reluctance, Captain and crew decided to turn in, closing the discourse with the Lord's Prayer. Heavy rain greeted our awakening and the old tub couldn't keep it all out. The Ford cabin in particular got more than its share. Plenty of hot porridge for breakfast helped keep out the damp, followed by boiled duck eggs and toast. Jack's stock rises daily. Captain's coffee was improved by an occasional drip. Landing party, Ralph and Bert, whose attire would have left some doubt as to which was the lifeboatman and which was the wreck, produced five pints of milk and two pounds of honey. Alec and Bert then made a trip to the village to find the shop shut for lunch. A phone call back to base gained the knowledge that uh, no one had tried to get in touch with the party, nor was anyone interested in their welfare. The rain showed signs of clearing, and by lunchtime, a fish and chips, brought back by Alec and Bert, was over. It was quite fine. After a further indulgence in discourse on politics, philosophy, etc., anchor was weighed. The settlement crack in the corner of the barn, butting onto the river, showed no further movement to the disappointment of Bert. After bailing the dinghy away from Coltishall at 2.50, the day now rapidly improved and the sail through Wroxham, Horning, to Barton Broad. 6.55, anchored in Neatishead.